General Custer informed them that he was embarking on another expedition and that they might be called upon to serve. Upon his return, young Hawk decided to discontinue his service, but his father insisted that he should go. Later, Son of the Star received a letter from Custer, requesting additional scouts. It was announced that Son of the Star would convene a council in his own house, and many attended. Son of the Star stated, My boys, I have received a letter from a white man asking for some of you boys to serve as scouts. He informed them that they would serve under long hair, Custer, and this was not surprising, as they had heard about his plans for another expedition. Additionally, Son of the Star had been to Washington. His words were heard by everyone present, and all that was necessary to say was, I will go. Young Hawk's father declared, I will go, and my son too. Those who pledged to go at this time and later enlisted included Bob-tailed Bull, Stabbed, Charging Bull, Horns in Front, Young Hawk, Bull in the Water, Little Brave, Bloody Knife, Tall Bear, High Bear, One Feather, Running Wolf, Red Star, Strikes Two, Howling Wolf, White Eagle, Crooked Horn, Scabby Wolf, Pretty Face, Curly Head, Black Fox, and One Horn. Some scouts had already re-enlisted at Fort Lincoln and were already in service. Red Bear was requested to stay by Crooked Horn so that they could return to Fort Lincoln together, and he agreed to do so. Fred Gerard led them to the office of the commanding officer, submitting Red Bear's permit. After a brief wait, he informed them that they were to enlist, procure uniforms and weapons. Following the medical examination, Gerard took them to Custer's office, where they encountered Custer's brother, Tom, the one with the scar on his face. He raised his hand, prompting Gerard to instruct the Indians to do the same. Custer entered shortly after and conveyed through Gerard that they were the last scouts to enlist. Due to the expedition's readiness, they were required to remain on duty at Fort Lincoln. Soldier and bobtailed bull encountered Custer at his camp on the riverbank, inside his own tent with Gerard serving as the interpreter. Custer commented, Bobtailed bull, right here in front of me, is truly kind-hearted and possesses admirable character. I am delighted to have him in this place. I'm happy he decided to enlist. The upcoming expedition will be challenging, but we'll all face the same difficulties together. I'm genuinely pleased to have him in my party, and I conveyed this sentiment in Washington. We're going to live and fight as one, like children of the same father and mother. The great-grandfather has a plan, the Sioux camps have come together, and you and I must collaborate for the great father and support each other. The great father is content that it was easy took few words, to get Son of the Star to provide scouts for the work we have ahead. He's also pleased with Son of the Star's cooperation in furthering the Great Father's plan. Personally, I'm ready to contribute in any way I can, and you must do the same. Here's how it is, my brothers. If, unfortunately, we lose any of the men Son of the Star has provided, their efforts won't be forgotten by the government. While their families will be saddened by their loss, there will be some solace in the compensation that the United States government will provide. Bob-tailed bull responded, That's good to hear, my brother. My kids and other family members will be beneficiaries of my salary and additional rewards. I'm glad you mentioned this because I see there's some gain even if I lose my life. Custer then declared, no need for further words, Bob-tailed bull is appointed as the leader and soldier will be second in command of the scouts. It was early in the morning when the bugle sounded, signaling the camp to disband, and the march commenced. The army arranged itself in order towards the fort. Gerard informed the scouts that they would have their own company, and they were the first to parade on the fort grounds. The parade concluded and the march began, led by Custer. Four Dakota scouts who had been at Fort Lincoln joined the Arikara. Among these scouts were Karu, Matok Shah, Mach Payas Ka, White Cloud, and Buffalo Ancestor. The initial camp was set up on both sides of the Hart River. A herd of cattle accompanied the march to provide beef for the soldiers. He spotted them on the first day's march. The white soldiers received their pay at this camp, but the scouts did not receive any compensation as they had just enlisted. Two Arakara scouts, Stabbed and Goose, were dispatched ahead with a letter to deliver to the camp across the river. Across the river there were Crow Scouts, and their interpreter, man with a calfskin vest, Mitch Boyer, crossed the river to inform them about it. When Custer's army reached Camp 20, 
Red Star observed the army on the march up the Yellowstone from across the river. Stabbed and Goose returned to Custer's camp and provided their report. Camp 20 served as the main camp for the infantry, the band, all the wagons, and some of the mules. An inspection of the horses of the scouts and the cavalry took place at this location. They broke camp and continued marching with the band playing continuously. Custer and Bloody Knife passed by, and Bloody Knife conveyed, The general says we are all marching. There are numerous enemies in the country. If we attack their camp and are defeated, we must retreat in small groups. You scouts must not run away nor return to your homes. The subsequent order stipulated that if our command broke up into squads or individual horsemen, this camp would be the designated place for reassembling all those who had scattered. Personally, I was pleased to hear the band playing as far as we could hear. Some cannons were being brought along. We reached the mouth of the Tongue River, where a camp was set up. We marched up to a hill overlooking the Elk River and then descended to the mouth of the Tongue River. Right at this location was an abandoned Dakota camp. There lay the body of a soldier, surrounded by clubs and sticks, suggesting he had been beaten to death, with only the bones remaining. Custer stood still for some time, gazing down at the soldier's remains. They discovered a burial scaffold adorned with alternating black and red uprights, symbolizing the interment of a brave man. Custer ordered the scaffold to be dismantled, instructing Isaiah, Isaiah Dorman, a black man, to remove the clothing and wrappings from the body. As they turned the body, a partially healed wound just below the right shoulder became visible. The scaffold also contained small rawhide bags with horn spoons and partially crafted moccasins. Isaiah disposed of the body in the river and later as he fished there, it is assumed he utilized it as bait. They set up camp in this area and the following day crossed the Tongue River, traversed the Badlands and established a camp at the mouth of the Rosebud. A steamboat was present, facilitating the transport of cannons across the Yellowstone. The group waited while the scouts ventured up the river. Two days later, the scouts returned with news of significant Dakota trails on both sides of the Rosebud. Across the Yellowstone, there was another camp opposite this one. Six Crow Scouts and an interpreter crossed from that camp. They dismantled the camp and proceeded up the Rosebud River. Howling Wolf, Running Wolf, and Curly Head were sent back from this camp with mail to the base camp. Mules were issued at this camp for carrying supplies with the scouts receiving five mules for their provisions. Gerard informed them that he wanted them to perform their death songs, anticipating the impending fight due to the spotted Dakota Trail. Custer, with a heart akin to an Indian, always suggested additions to their ceremonies. Mounted on horses, they circled around, singing the songs. Subsequently, they fell in behind Custer and continued marching until a halt was called. Custer then directed two groups of scouts to advance, one on each side of the river. The following morning during breakfast, Bloody Knife emerged, leading a horse having spent the entire night outside. Subsequently, the bugle sounded, and we prepared our horses. Custer led the way, with the scouts following and flanking the marching army. Bob-tailed Bull took charge, accompanied by Strikes Two and others on one side. As night fell, they reached an abandoned Dakota camp where signs of a Sundance Circle were evident. Their indication showed that the Dakotas had conducted medicine rituals, arranging and smoothing the sand and drawing pictures. Dakota scouts within Custer's army suggested that this meant the enemy was aware of the army's approach. Inside one of the sweat lodges was a long mound of sand, upon which Red Bear, Red Star, and Soldier observed figures depicting Custer's men on one side and the Dakota on the other, with dead men lying between them, their heads facing the Dakotas. The Arakara scouts interpreted this as a sign that the Dakota medicine was stronger, suggesting defeat for Custer's men against the Dakotas. As they marched along the right bank of the Rosebud, they observed Dakota inscriptions on the sandstone hills to their left. One of these inscriptions depicted two buffaloes in combat, and the Arakara provided various interpretations of its meaning. In one of the sweat lodges at a campsite, Young Hawk noticed three stones near the entrance arranged in a row and painted red. In Dakota Sign Language, this signified that the Great Spirit had granted them victory, and if the Whites did not arrive, they would seek them out. Soldier observed offerings, including four sticks standing upright with a buffalo calfskin tied on, along with cloth and other valuable items, indicating a significant religious ceremony. 
This observation was shared by Strikes 2, Little Sue, and Boy Chief. All the Arikara understood this as a sign that the Dakotas were confident of winning. Soldier later heard that Sitting Bull had conducted ceremonies at this camp. After passing the Buffalo Charging Inscription, they reached the fork of the Rosebud River, approximately where the Cheyennes are currently located. The six Crow Scouts, along with their interpreter, who had been scouting, returned at this camp. They reported numerous abandoned Dakota camps along the Rosebud. The entire army halted here and had lunch on a hill. While the scouts were dining, Custer arrived at their camp with his orderly, the one carrying his flag. The Arikara sat in a half circle, with stabbed on the right of Red Bear. Custer sat down with one knee on the ground and asked, What are your thoughts on the Crow Scouts' report? They claim there are large Sioux camps. What do you think will be the outcome of it all? The other officers gathered around the fire and stood beside it. Custer conveyed through Gerard reiterated, My sole purpose in engaging these people in battle is to lead them into the fight and seize many horses from the Sioux. Custer extended his arms, expressing his happiness and pleasure to have familiar faces on this expedition. Among you are faces I recognize, people I've met on one or two past trips, and I'm thrilled to be back together. On this journey, if we emerge victorious upon our return, Bloody Knife, Bobtailed Bull, Soldier, Strikes Two, and Stabbed will proudly lead those who have proven themselves as brave young men in parade marches. When your Chief Son of the Star witnesses you in this parade, I am certain he will take pride in seeing his boys. Addressing Gerard, Custer added, I want you to convey to these young men, these boys, that if we succeed, upon our return, my brother Bloody Knife and I will represent you in Washington, and perhaps we will bring you to Washington in person. The bugles sounded and they proceeded with Bobtailed Bull leading the way. They encountered yet another deserted Dakota camp, significant in size, spanning from one half to one third of a mile across. Evidence suggested rain at this camp, as the sod around the tent circles had been disturbed to channel off the water. From this point they could discern, in the distance, the hill known as Custer's Last Look, approximately 12 miles away. They headed towards these hills, planning to halt briefly for supper and then continue throughout the night. This makeshift camp was situated on both sides of the Rosebud, and it became very dark after they had finished supper. Across the Rosebud, Crooked Horn shouted, Strikes the Lodge, Saddle Up, and Red Star, along with Red Foolish Bear, Black Fox, and Bull. Led by Forked Horn, this group set out, and here Red Bear learned that Bobtailed Bull had been ahead and had left around noon. This marked the commencement of the night march, and they rode throughout the night. At dawn, they reached the designated spot for breakfast, feeling exhausted and dismounting for a brief rest. Bull in the water and Red Bear were in charge of unpacking one mule, and the former suggested, Let's prepare breakfast because if we journey to the happy hunting grounds, we should do so with full bellies. While fetching water for their breakfast, they had to traverse the soldiers' camp. The soldiers were sprawled in groups on the ground, snoring, as they were extremely fatigued and had lain down where they had unsaddled. The camp disbanded, the horses trotted, and the army halted on a hill where Custer descended to join them. His directives were to proceed ahead swiftly and seize the Dakota horses. Stabbed rode around on horseback, traversing the area and encouraging the young men to conduct themselves bravely. Young men, maintain your courage. Don't think of yourselves as children, he said. Today will be a tough battle. We've been informed that there's a significant Sioux camp ahead. When we confront a wounded buffalo bull, we fear him despite the absence of bullets to harm us. Recognizing that many of us were young and inexperienced, he aimed to prepare them for their inaugural real fight. He stood at a distance while expressing these words, rubbing some clay between his hands. Then he prayed, My father, on this day, I recall the promises you've made to me. I speak to you on behalf of my young men. Subsequently, he summoned the young men, instructing them to hold up their shirts so that he could apply the potent medicine to their bodies. They approached one by one, he spat on the clay and then rubbed it onto their chests. He had brought along this clay specifically for this purpose. The mule train carrying supplies was left behind and Pretty Face was assigned the responsibility of overseeing it. 